and welcome to the Wellness Plus Podcast. I'm your host, Karina Rachel, and I'm joined today by Michelle Norris. She is co-founder and CEO of Paleo FX. And right now, I feel that we are all just inundated <laughs> with different diets. Mm-hmm. Paleo, ketogenic diets, intermittent fasting, veganism. Um, and I would just love to kind of hear your perspective on these different diets and, you know, just giving people recommendations if they're feeling confused about which way of eating they should try. Okay. So my, um, my disclaimer here is obviously I am the founder, <laughs> uh, the CEO and the co-founder of Paleo FX. So obviously I gravitate towards a paleo diet. However, I am of the belief that you don't have to eat meat to be healthy. I think that most people do need meat to be healthy, but there are some that don't. Mm -hmm. But at the bottom line is, I think everybody has to stop eating processed foods, Mm -hmm. stop eating sugars, stop eating grains um, in order to be healthy. So I think everybody has to eat whole real foods to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, That's my bottom line. So the thing is, is that, um, each person is completely individual. And mm-hmm. so I know for, uh, for instance, our daughter, Kaylee, doesn't do very well on red meat. Um, she likes chicken, she likes fish, but red meat doesn't sit real well with her. So mm-hmm. she tends to do better with a lot of vegetables, um, a lot of carbs, and with, you know, chicken and fish. Um, myself, having found out that I'm APOE 3-4, I have to, and I have a GAD1 allele. Um, those are two different things. One, um, the APOE 3-4 is um, the marker for Alzheimer's, and then the GAD1 is a marker for glutamine, um, where glutamine is very excitatory to my brain and is tends to be um, toxic for me. So I have to watch the amount of glutamine that I get. And um, so we're talking beef, chicken, um, those type of things, pork, Um, So I tend to have those occasionally. I don't have them a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I tend more towards lamb and bison and turkey and fish. So I go that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is, too, of course, the allele for Alzheimer's is, for me, saturated fat tends to not be protective, brain protective. For Mm -hmm. most people, um, saturated fat is very brain protective. And so you would want to eat those things. So I think finding what's right for you is really, um, what matters at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally don't have anything against, I, I respect and admire that people who are vegan or vegetarian and do it for, um, and they, and they do it for, um, ethical reasons, more power to them. Totally respect that. And I totally believe in it. If you are doing veganism or vegetarianism because you are for health reasons or you believe that it's healthier, that's very misinformed. And I think that you need to become educated about um, animal products and the actual benefits to um, consuming animal products. Um, At the end of the day, I think that vegans and vegetarians and people who are paleo um, have a whole lot more in common than they don't. Um, we both believe that the system of confined animal feeding operations, CAFOs, um, are, and factory farming is something that should go away that we, we, none of us believe in that. So we believe that you should have good animal husbandry, that you, you should treat animals with respect Mm -hmm. and particularly when taking their life, you should treat them with reverence. Um, so obviously factory farming does not do that. They don't, um, treat the animals respectfully. They don't take their lives with, with reverence. And, um, you and I are kind of having a conversation about this off camera. And I, my belief is this, that if animals are living the life that they were intended to live and they're going to die just like we are, that's just part of it. The circle of life is that we are the higher um, brained being here, okay? Mm -hmm. For all intents and purposes, we're the ones in charge. Mm -hmm. And, but at the end of the day, and it's so cliche to say this, but there's a circle of life Mm -hmm. and they feed us, plants feed us, plants. And and this is another thing is plants have feelings too. And that sounds Mm -hmm. really weird to a lot of people, but it's been scientifically proven that plants have feelings and that they, Mm -hmm. they react 
to the attention that is given to them and that they actually can be nurtured and grow bigger and healthier and better if they are nurtured in a particular way. Um, and so this is all scientific. It's not my opinion. It is scientific evidence. So the thing is, is that all of these things were meant to feed each other. Mm -hmm. Animals feed off of other animals. Animals eat plants, whatever. Humans eat plants and animals. And then, of course, you have out in the ocean, you have predators that, you know, that every, everything ends up ultimately being prey. We're all right. prey at some point. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that because of the fact that we're the ones that are in charge, so to speak, here, um, we end up ultimately going, we end up doing our part. Mm -hmm. Because when we finally die and we go back into the ground, we feed the plants and the animals. And so... It's just the circle of life. And that, like I said, that can be very cliche, but that's the, that's the way things were intended to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just honestly believe that when we um, look at everything that we do as far as animals are concerned, when we raise them, when we, the way that we treat them and everything, ultimately we're consuming the way we treated them. Mm -hmm. It's energy. Everything here is energy. So if we're treating animals with, with respect and concern and care and reverence when we bring them up and then when we take their lives, that's what we're consuming. So we're consuming a healthy, happy animal that lived its life the way it was intended to live it. Mm -hmm. When we consume an animal that is not raised that way, that is not, their life is not taken that way, if they're treated harshly or they're treated inhumanely, which I do not agree with at all, we are consuming that energy as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking in, you know, they. this is a, also a scientific fact. So hunters, they will hunt down a deer. If the deer knows it's being hunted and it gets into a, a state where it starts releasing um, adrenaline, and you kill the deer and then you consume that deer, you can taste the adrenaline in the deer. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. It's why some deer can taste very, very gamey and other deer don't. Because if a deer was killed in that process where there's adrenaline rushing, same thing in, in um, cows or whatever. If they're killed in a way that is terrifying to them in the end and they have adrenaline running through their body, you're going to taste that. And you're taking that energy into your body. So I, m our, my belief is that we need to take that out of the equation. Mm -hmm. When we are, this is the thing, they're giving us life. They're giving us their life. Why would we treat that with anything but respect and reverence? Mm -hmm. And why would I want to consume an animal that wasn't treated that way? Because right. I'm ultimately taking that animal's energy into my body. Mm -hmm. So... I, I'm a big believer that we need to get rid of confined animal feeding operations, factory farming. I don't think that it works. Um, it's not for the environment and it doesn't work for hum humankind either. Mm -hmm. so. Definitely. And that doesn't even consider like what's the physical health of the animals in these factory farming operations. Because we can talk about the hormones they give them to mm -hmm. plump them up. Most of those animals get sick from being in such mm -hmm. confined spaces and they're under a lot of stress all of this so then they have to give the animals antibiotics just to keep them alive mm -hmm. you know not to make it a healthy happy animal but like literally just so that it won't die on right them. um and unfortunately you know considering the physical health of the animal the emotional stress mm -hmm. and duress that the animal was under um you're totally right mm -hmm. and in a you know, certainly here in America, most of the food that you see is animal products, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it's become, I think, such a, uh, like, quantity-driven culture, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that we have them being like, oh, well, we'll genetically modify the plant so we can grow more food. Mm -hmm. or we're going to, you know, give hormones and antibiotics to the animals so that we can, you know, have bigger animals and more mm -hmm. of them. Um, you just start seeing how all of these different monetary considerations on behalf of the food industry 
are coming at a really huge cost, not mm-hmm. just to the animals th- themselves, mm-hmm. uh, but to us, the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yeah, because you take into consideration that these factory farms, the methane gas that's coming from these farms is, you know, quadruple and sometimes more um, what a typical farm mm-hmm would would put off that's that's that part that part right there then you take into consideration the way that we farm and we ranch is that it's not the way that it we should be Mm -hmm. um so we should not be monocropping we should be um doing crop rotation with animals and so and they need to be part of that process and so when you see like in countries like coast in um in uh south america they don't allow confined animal feeding operations. They don't allow factoring farming. Everything is grass fed. Every all of their the way that they do everything is um, rotating of crops and rotating of animals. And uh, if you um, just check out um, Polyface Farms, which is Joel Salatin, we've been able to. He's he's an amazing human being, um, really incredible man, and had the opportunity and the privilege to get to meet him, but also visit his farm and really see directly from him how he runs that farm and the way that the animals are respected and that they are, that they live the life that was intended for them, that they are, they are, um, in the way that they move everything. And, um, and it's good for the earth. It's good for the, their soil. It's good for everything that they're doing. And so, um, Amazing operation, and there's no reason why that can't be all everywhere. Right. No reason whatsoever. Right. I think in general, looking at the um, just move from, you know, for a really long time, most people were farmers. Mm-hmm. You know, you relied on the food that you grew yourself. Mm-hmm. At some point, that transitioned. There were less farmers, and now it's to the point where. There's so few people that are just like running their own farms uh, that it has created this illusion of a food shortage. Mm -hmm. Um, But you're completely right. If we had a shift towards this more natural farming and all of these different uh, kind of components to help create healthy land, healthy animals, and healthy food that you create from it... um, it's it's ridiculous to think that oh there's no way to feed the human population without GMOs and factory farming and I right. think that is just um, you know you hear that so much coming out of the mainstream that people just kind of accept it as fact mm-hmm. um, but it's it's created a very very um, scary mm-hmm. you know kind of um, you know it's part of our culture it's part of our diet and mm-hmm. I think the implications are just really widespread. And then you see veganism as kind of a a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can definitely understand the ethical reasons for not eating meat. Mm -hmm. And for many years, I had given up meat. And I was Mm -hmm. very much like, you know, I was very against the consumption of meat and animal Mm -hmm. products. Um, And it was after a couple of years of seeing how that diet was affecting me, I started integrating back fish. And I felt a lot better. Um, fish and eggs were the first things that I started integrating back in and I immediately felt better I was having like fainting episodes and stuff yeah. and it, it was it was getting scary and I was like mm-hmm. man well I really want to eat this way but my body was telling me like hey Karina you're not going to be able to, right. to sustain this um, and so I started kind of adding those foods back in and then a couple of years later the kind of surge of grass-fed meats um, kind of started coming coming up and it became much easier to mm-hmm. find those those healthier mm-hmm. animal products um so i did i started reintegrating um the grass-fed beef and bone broth and all these things and i just realized wow i feel really good mm-hmm. eating these things and i noticed that i was actually eating less carbohydrates less of these like you know you because unfortunately when you think about a vegan diet um a lot of vegan diets don't have enough vegetables in them. Um, so you're eating the carbs and the grains and the, all of these things. Um, and I was actually gaining weight, and it was really weird, and I didn't feel awesome. Uh, but when I did kind of switch, you know, back to including meats in my diet, I just felt so much better. Mm-hmm. Well, that and you end up eating a lot less of everything else, but right. because you're being satiated, I mean, because at the end of the day, the fat, the animal fat and protein are what satiate you and keep you from over 
tending to overeat um, all these carbohydrates and that type of thing. So, you know, you, what's interesting to me is when you take into account um, the fact that our brains are, the majority of our brains are fat. We need fat. And it's really difficult to get all of your fat from, um, from plants. Um, so, and the problem is, is the majority of vegans and vegetarians tend to, um, stick more to vegetable oils, which are not actually good for them instead of incorporating like the coconut oil, the avocado oil, the, um, olive oil, those type of things. I think they're starting to now, but back that wasn't, that wasn't really prevalent. Now we're starting to realize. So canola oil was corn oil, all of these soy. things. Yeah. <laughs> soy, soybean oil is a big part of their diet. And so of course, one of the biggest and largest endocrine disruptors is soy and it mimics our hormones. It wreaks havoc with your entire home hormonal cascade. Um, and it's just can cause a lot of problems, but I found that it's interesting that you'll you'll hear um, them talk about how uh, if I go if I when I first went vegetarian or when I first went vegan I was so much healthier. That's because you got you initially got away from the standard American diet. So yeah, you were gonna feel better right. because you were probably not incorporating so many. Because when you first tend to become healthy or start eating a healthy diet, you tend to get away from the processed foods and all of that stuff. The, the, but what ends up ultimately happening is the shift where you end up thinking you're doing all this healthy stuff, like you're eating soy instead of meat and you're eating, um, you start eating more grains and all of that because you need it, because you need it in order for you to be satiated. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's where the real problem lies is that, that there, that, the nutrients aren't there either. And it's funny because I find that m the majority of people who are paleo or primal or keto, well, not keto. Let me back that up. Sorry. Paleo or primal eat a lot more vegetables mm -hmm. than people that are vegetarian or vegan, well, which is kind of funny Yeah. when you think about it. But we eat a lot more vegetables. I eat a ton of vegetables. Mm -hmm. I eat a little bit of meat and um, animal, you know, eggs and that kind of thing. I eat a little bit of that but I eat a lot of vegetables. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about keto and everything. So keto, of course, is a very low carb diet, very low carb. Mm -hmm. It is not for everyone. Right. Um, it, I highly recommend, um, particularly women who are menopausal and what have you, you need to really do your research and really know what you're doing um, because you can just really wreck your health if you're, mm -hmm. if you're not in the know and you don't really know. And again, this is, goes back to know what your DNA is because you need to know what you're working with. So I was keto for a long time and I actually felt really good doing keto. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, being APOE 3-4, I was doing damage. Mm -hmm. I was doing things that were not brain protective for me. Right. So I think you need to know all of that. I think you need to know what your, what your, your um, genetic makeup is for one thing. But then you need to experiment and see what do I, how do I feel? When, when do I feel my best when I'm eating meat, when I'm eating vegetables, when I'm eating a little bit of both, what, what does that look like for you? Um, am I eating a lot of fat? Um, and that's the other thing is that keto can tend toward high fat, moderate protein and very low carb, or it can be high fat, high protein and very low carb, or it can be, it's, it's another one that's just one of those things that has to be tweaked by the individual and right. really has to be worked out what actually works for you. Another thing we talked, we kind of briefly touched on intermittent fasting. Again, that's something that is, um, people call that kind of a diet. It's along the paleo lines. And the thing is, is that it's really difficult to intermittent fast if you're not paleo or primal or keto. And the reason being is that mean that there's hardly a way to do that because you're not getting satiated and you get right. yourself satiated by protein and fat. Mm -hmm. And so being able to intermittent fast is really is a lot easier when you are eating animal products and, and fats and meats and mm -hmm. stuff because you can go for longer periods of time without eating 
And so um, I've done a lot of intermittent fasting. Um, there's a lot of times where I have not, I don't, wouldn't eat until one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, today was one of those days I had a bar um, a little while ago. So <laughs> I haven't eaten anything other than that, um, other than drinking um, my hydrate and um, my the, some products that I'm involved in with this company. Um, so those are the things that I do. Um, and I just listen to my body though. So some days I wake up and I really need to eat. And so I will. Yeah. And so, but the other days when I don't feel like, okay, I'm good. I don't, I will eat when I'm, my body finally goes, Hey, I really need some food. Um, so it just really depends on how that works for you. The other thing is too, is that you may feel like it's okay, but how do you actually feel? Are you sleeping? Okay. Cause Intermittent fasting can mess with your sleeping mm -hmm. as well if you are not very careful. So you need to know, um, and I track everything. So I have a, an aura ring, I have a Bella Beat leaf, I track my, I have another tracker um, as well. All of them track my sleep, all of them track my activity. Um, the Bella Beat is great for women, particularly because if you have a cycle, it'll help you track your cycle, helps mm -hmm. you track your meditation, which is great. But I, um, I love all of this because I can correlate things to either what I'm eating, what I've done during the day, if I've had a stressful day, if I, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. did I, did I eat something weird and now I didn't sleep? So I can track all of that and I keep track of that on a daily basis. So I know um, how much I slept and um, generally, and this is the thing, a lot of women don't understand this or don't really know this. They think, oh, well, if I starve myself a little bit and do this and do that, whatever. The thing is at the end of the day, if you want to lose weight, you need to sleep. Mm -hmm. Sleep is your best friend. I can yeah. correlate all my largest weight loss from having the issue with, um, uh, we've kind of touched on this before. I ha um, had a severe mold exposure. It caused a whole host of problems in my hormones, mm -hmm. caused a 28 pound weight gain out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, since I went paleo almost 16 years ago uh, until 2015, I had only fluctuated in weight up and down four pounds then at that point. I stopped wow. having, you know, 20,000 sizes in my closet and only now I'm now a size six then I suddenly gained 28 pounds out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew there was something wrong because nothing had changed in the way that I was eating. It was right. all hormonal and, and that type of thing. The thing is, is if I, I was tracking, so I knew where things had changed and what I was doing. So mm -hmm. if I enter something new, like I started taking CBD oil not that long ago on a regular basis. Um, I would do CBD oil every once in a while, but I started doing it to track and see how did I feel did I feel less, did I feel calmer? Did I f feel like it was helping suppress my cortisol and my, my stress hormones? Mm -hmm. Did I, did I sleep better? All of those things. So I started tracking those things. So I track everything. I track the stuff that I do during the day. If I had to, um, if I had very stressful meetings, I put my, everything down on my tracker. And so I know if I had a very stressful meeting and I am not sleeping at night and then in the middle of the night I wake up and I'm thinking about what was happening in that meeting, then I know that I have to do more meditation. I have to do the things that are going to keep that cortisol at, you know, keep, make sure that I keep that at bay. And so um, these are all things that we can manipulate as humans, which is amazing. And so why wouldn't you? Right. You know, it's, it's awesome. Right. No, we're definitely living in a day and age where, yeah, with all of these different techno technologies and trackers and stuff, we can just gain such an insight to what's mm -hmm. going on internally. Um, we talked in a previous podcast about the genetic testing and blood testing and mm -hmm. just kind of knowing, you know, what what is your starting point, so to speak, mm -hmm. for foods that your body maybe has a sensitivity to or, you know, some people are just lacking uh, the enzyme they need to be able to digest certain foods, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, which you would never really know unless you went and had those tests done. Right. I think it's also important to point out for anyone who um, didn't hear our first podcast that you had had, um, you know, migraines from age 17, mm -hmm. a diagnosis of chronic fatigue, chronic pain, 
uh, rheumatoid arthritis, mm -hmm. and all of these conditions were resolved in, what did you say, three weeks? Three on weeks. Paleo diet? Three weeks. I mean, that is incredible. Yeah. Um, and I think that it speaks so much to, you know, how much power we have mm -hmm. through controlling what we're putting into our bodies. Right. And unfortunately, um, the way that the foods are processed, the way that they are, you know, literally engineered to be mm -hmm. addictive, to keep people eating, to keep people hungry. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really can, um, can see how clearly our diets are affecting our health. And well, this is... This is a thing that I'm going to jump in here and say this, mm -hmm. is that the tagline is, bet you can't eat just one. Oh, yeah. What do you think that means? Mm -hmm. You can't eat just one chip. There's no, and it's because it's engineered that way. Mm -hmm. So they, they use our DNA and our wiring against us for us to continue to consume and never have, we, what happens is this food is called food with no breaks. So it turns off our satiety receptors mm -hmm. and basically keeps telling our body, mm, still hungry, mm, still hungry, still need more food. Come on, keep, keep it coming, keep it right. coming. Right. That is the engineering of our food system. And that is the engineering that they, they use because they play on the fact that we're wired this way. Mm -hmm. And so if they can turn that off, we will keep eating. We will keep consuming. We will keep coming back. We will keep paying more. Right. And why do you think the food that's the most addictive is so freaking cheap? Right. Guess what? Mm -hmm. It's not. Ultimately, in the long run, it's way more expensive because the crops that are used for most of these foods are the crops that are subsidized by our country, by by our taxpayers. We subsidize it. If you knew the true cost of those foods, it would outrage you. And that we only allow these foods to be the things that are um, affordable, particularly for people who are on a fixed income, low income, whatever. And so getting the food that is really nutrient dense and really um, good for you it becomes difficult because our co our country has paid for us to ha consume these foods because they're cheaper. Mm -hmm. they, they're made a lot cheaper. Corn and soy are two of our most highly subsidized foods. They're also the foods that are used in engineering to make sure that we do not stop eating, that we keep consuming. And so they're cheap, cheap, cheap when you go to the grocery store. But at the end of the day, in two ways, and this is what I meant, I want to make this correlation. We end up ultimately in the long run paying a lot more because one, we need to keep consuming it. So we buy more, we eat more, and then we pay for it in our health. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, it's that's where it's going to cost the big bucks. Yeah. But in between that, the big thing that costs us more that we don't even recognize, that we don't even see, is it costs us our freedom. Mm -hmm. Our quality of life. I mean, like, how much, how many people out there have just resigned themselves to like, oh, I have back pain, I have stress, I have this problem, I have that problem. I'm just never going to feel good again. Mm -hmm. I mean. I felt that way. I, I mean, I think, I call that your normal. Yeah. You, this is my normal. This is just how my life is. This is just what my body does. It's just how things are. Mm -hmm. But when you switch to a diet with a whole foods diet, whatever that looks like for you, whole foods that are real, that are not processed, no added sugars, all of those things, real whole foods, whatever that looks like for you, when you shift to that, you will find a new normal. Mm -hmm. And the new normal will be free from headaches, from backache, from knee pain, from stomach aches, from chronic inflammation, from IBS, from fibromyalgia, all of these things, mm -hmm. because your body now is free to do what it's supposed to do. Right. And that's to thrive. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely think that, you know, and I love what you said at the beginning that, you know, veganism and paleo actually have far more in common than different. Mm -hmm. And just this one simple piece of like removing the processed foods is is so huge. And if there's, you know, one thing that I've probably, probably sound like a broken record to the people who've watched my YouTube videos. So I've been talking about the dangers of processed foods for like over a decade, almost mm -hmm. a decade now. Um, and it was interesting because, you know, we are, you know, especially in, in the United States, I don't think I was ever shown that there was another option. Nope. Like when I was in college and I, you know, we were studying 
um, cancer pathology. And I, and I just started going, wow, well, it looks like, you know, if you ask, okay, well, what causes more DNA mutations? Mm -hmm. You know, because mutating your DNA is basically how you end up with cancer. Your cells lose their ability to, you know, kill those harmful cells with DNA mutations. And regenerate. Um, well, processed food ingredients, all these different chemicals, you can start going into specific ones, but really and truly the, the overall picture was like, wow, all of this food processing in general mm -hmm. is just setting us up for all kinds of different illness. Um, we talked about Alzheimer's in the previous podcast as well. Um, so it was just really interesting to me because I hadn't really even been aware that like there was processed foods and there's a holistic diet or a natural diet. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny because, you know, they take this uh, way of eating that has really been the way of eating for people for far longer than processed foods have been. But they just have so much, you know, media control and so much uh, influence on our thinking that now like we think the norm is the processed foods and the junk food and the things that comes in a box inside of a plastic bag and all of that. Um, and it's just, I'm so thankful that now uh, the times are kind of shifting and mm -hmm. it's becoming more understood that those foods are really dangerous for you. Um, and there's this other way of eating, the organic way of eating. Mm -hmm. And it's like this new thing. Well, actually, organic farming was the way that people ate for, mm -hmm. you know, so... Centuries. So, <laughs> yeah, for such a long time. And it just really speaks to how much the um, technological advances, as wonderful as they are, mm -hmm. and as life-saving as they are in so many ways... There's just a, a place for them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about the foods that you're eating every single day, mm -hmm. highly processed is just not the way to go. Right. Uh, so for somebody who's sitting there looking at, okay, well, veganism, paleo, I mean, do you have like a, a guideline that you would give them for knowing what to try? I mean, we talked about getting DNA testing, blood testing. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to kind of gain an insight of what's mm -hmm. going to serve your body better. Right. Well, at the end of the day, it comes to you doing your own N equals one experimenting. You have mm. to choose what ends up ultimately being right for you. And this is a thing. If you are, um, if you have a problem with consuming animals, obviously that might not work for you. Mm. You might not feel good about it. You might not. My, my suggestion would be animal products are not, when you think about eggs or you think about honey or you think about things that come milk or dairy or what have you. And dairy can be highly inflammatory. So that, that, that's not always a good thing either, but what, what needs to happen is that you just need to test and see what's right for you. Mm -hmm. And ultimately paleo may be the end all be all for you or paleo might not be. Mm -hmm. And, um, being a vegetarian might be what works for you. If you're staying away from the processed stuff and you're staying away from like soy and grains and things, mm -hmm. if you're staying away from that and you're really truly consuming um, really good fats, avocados, avocado oil, coconut oil, um, olive oil. And then when I say coconut oil, make sure you're not APOE 3-4 or 4-4. But if, you, um, if you're not, then those are really, all of those are great things to be consuming and, and eating. And butter is another thing. Um, if I was, if, if I was going to be vegetarian, what have you, I, I think I would still accept, of course, ample E3, 4 or 4, 4. Butter mm -hmm. is an, is a great animal product without eating an animal. Right. The thing is, is that n no animal was killed in that process. Right. So if that's really what you have an issue to, the thing is, is that, um, I, I, I don't know. I just think you have to do all of that, you know, experimenting yourself. Nobody mm -hmm. can tell you what's going to be the best for you. Mm -hmm. Your body will tell you. Yeah. You were speaking um, a little earlier to me off camera about uh, a woman who had kind of transitioned from being a big like veganism advocate to becoming a paleo advocate. Can you just Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So um, she was a leader in the vegetarian um, movement, vegan. She was vegan, um, big in the vegetarian movement, and realized that it was actually making her sick and that 
some of the myths that are perpetuated through the vegan and vegetarian um, movements are are myths. And the thing is, I know that m- most of them believe it. But talking about the fact that it's not that consuming animals is not good for the environment. No, confined animal feeding operations are not good for the environment. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, they're not good for Earth. They're not good for the planet, whatever. But it's across the board. This across the board thing doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And so she finally realized that that was all not true. And that at the end of the day, you could be a whole lot healthier eating meats mm-hmm. and eating animal products mm-hmm. if you consumed um, animals that were humanely raised, that were grass fed, that are not being fed antibiotics and um, hormones to boost their um, growth and that type of thing. So the thing is, is that um, she came out against it. She wrote a book called The Vegetarian Myth, and um, and it didn't win her any friends in that movement. She was actually um, they came after her, and uh, she was uh, she's been a speaker at Paleo FX, Lear Keith, um, amazing. It's a great book. Um, but it kind of tells you really the truth behind all of it and, um, that that's not the, that's not the diet that's going to save the world. The diet that's going to save the world is the diet that actually gets rid of confined animal feeding operations, factory farming Mm -hmm. and, and feeds the world. And the thing is, is at the end of the day, before confined animal feeding operations and factory farming, before all of that, we were, Mm -hmm. we were feeding the world. And it can be done. The thing is, is that we need to go back. That's the other piece of us being sick is that we don't eat things that are local to our area that actually have inherent immunities that we need because we live in this area. Because, um, you know, for instance, um, getting rid of some types of allergies, um, you can consume um, a tablespoon a day of local honey, raw honey, from local bees, and they actually will boost your immune system to get help you get rid of, rid of seasonal allergies. Mm-hmm. It, my husband uses it. He has seasonal allergies. and Well, he doesn't because he does this, so he ends up not having them. Mm-hmm. And these are things, these are natural immune boosters because we're eating within, well, we're eating local. We're not eating. The problem that's happened is that we now eat foods that's shipped to us from across the country. Mm-hmm. And what do you think happens to that food by, from the time, that, because it's being shipped from New York to California or California to New York or, or whatever, in that process of being shipped, what do you think the nutrient density, what's happening to the nutrient density of that food? It's being diminished mm-hmm. because the longer that you go from when either something's picked or um, an animal is killed, the the less nutrient density it is, unless you are properly aging something. That's totally different because there's a whole process for that that's not processed, but it processes meat. It's something that was used for centuries to be able to prolong a meat supply through the winter and everything. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a that's a different type of processing right. that's and that's actually useful and that continues to be you now see and this is something that I'm really super happy about and proud of is that you see in the back in the culinary world charcuteurs are now coming back into um, they were seeming to go out, you know, just going away. The whole art was going away. And this is the, the process of being able to, um, uh, cure meats and do all of these things with, um, foods to be able to not just prolong their health for shelf life, but prolong their health for, for our health and right. for nutrient density and everything. And so they're done the proper way, not using chemicals and, and preservatives and all of that. They use a lot of natural things to be able to do that, which is, you know, the dry aging, the, all of that kind of stuff. So there's that. Yeah. But, you know, we need to eat more local to what we're, to where we live. And that's the way everything was done previously is that there were farms everywhere around where people lived and everybody, sh- you know, went, to, they, they, what, what happened mostly is there were farms and this farm would have, you know, whatever crop, cauliflower, broccoli, whatever. And this one would have green beans and you name it over here and peppers and tomatoes. And they would, they would end up switching and sharing. And right. that's how the whole thing. And then of course the grocery store was born and right. you know, all of that. And that just 
took us into this shipping for long distance and that's where shelf life came from and preservatives and you know pumping things full of hormones and all of that stuff was for those reasons and they're not needed we don't need that we can we can do all of it if we go back to the way we originally started Mm -hmm. feeding the -hmm. world and it's so interesting too um talking about foods that are getting shipped huge huge distances Mm -hmm. you know typically you know, they're sprayed with some kind of pesticide or something while they're growing. Mm-hmm. Then when they're picked, they're sprayed with something to delay ripening. Mm-hmm. Then when they arrive at the grocery store, they spray them with another chemical to go ahead and expedite the ripening process. Mm-hmm. And you just, you know, I don't know, that was a that was definitely a big eye-opener mm-hmm. for me. was like learning about, okay, well, what is the actual process of the foods that you're eating? Mm-hmm. And you start realizing, well, not only do the nutrients start diminishing mm-hmm. for, you know based on the duration of time between picking to consumption, but then they're also getting sprayed with who knows what. Mm -hmm. You know, they're probably not being uh, transported in refrigerated trucks and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. I mean, you can just really um, see how the foods are so depleted, Mm -hmm. you know. So from that nutritional standpoint of, you know, how are you going to eat something and is it going to satisfy you? Or are you going to just keep reaching for more food? Mm -hmm. Even if people are eating salads and vegetables and all of this, if it's coming from these mainstream producers, Mm -hmm. unfortunately those foods are probably so depleted of nutrients Mm -hmm. that, I mean, obviously it's still better for you than eating a Twinkie or something. Right. But unfortunately, even the healthy foods Mm -hmm. that are out there are probably not as healthful as they really should be. Um... And I know that the organic foods cost more. Mm -hmm. They do. But for myself, I'm like, this is an investment that I will make in myself Mm -hmm. because I understand how much more nutrient capacity you can retain in organic farming. Right. um, Or with organic farming. (laughs) Right. Um, And then, yeah, here in Austin, we've got lots of farmer's markets, and Mm -hmm. I just feel so... Uh, so lucky and, mm-hmm. and blessed that we have access to eat things mm-hmm. that are locally grown, that are grown naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Johnson's Backyard Garden, yeah. um, which is so cool because you can even go and work on their farm, mm-hmm. volunteer some of your time. You know, some people say, oh, I don't have the money to eat healthy, all this. And it's just really interesting. And mm-hmm. you said, you've said this several times, you know, actually, you can't afford not right. to eat healthy, right. you know? Um, so I just love that as an example. Hey, go volunteer on the farm. And they're going to send you home with a huge bag of organic mm-hmm. produce. Mm-hmm. Um, and boom, all you had to do was like take a little time that you might have spent, whatever, yeah. playing a game or doing something else right. or watching TV. I mean, we, especially in this country, I think everyone perpetually feels like we don't have enough time. We mm-hmm. don't have enough money, all of this. Mm-hmm. And yet if you really start talking to people, it's like, well, how much time are you spending? Yeah watching TV or doing these other Well, not only that, but reconnecting with nature. I mean, yeah. that, that's one of the most healthy things that you can do is reconnect with nature and, and connecting with your food. The, the other piece of this, too, that we haven't kind of touched on that I kind of want to get back to, too, is that we, we also used to eat in season, mm-hmm. and we don't do that anymore. The only thing that we did out of season before was when you would you would have an uh, what they would call a surplus of a crop and they would can. Mm-hmm. And then you would be sustained through the winter months when you didn't didn't have a lot of things. Now we can get everything anytime because it's being it's being farmed somewhere right. that's um and the thing is is that that's not really necessarily healthy for us too and i think we'll find out longer further down the road as these studies that they're doing on people that eat in season and people that don't eat in season how that affects their ultimate health because mm-hmm. that's the other piece of this too is that we were given these amazing incredible bodies mm-hmm. to do amazing and incredible things but we also have mother nature who is very smart and knows what we need mm-hmm. when we need it. And the problem is, is that we've outsmarted mother nature mm-hmm. and that doesn't ever really work for very long. Mm-hmm. And so we're finding that, you know, that people are healthier if they continue, if they eat in season, if you eat things that are meant to be in this season. So you can go and look that stuff up. 
right. and find out what are the things that you really should be eating right now. Like when when are the when should these crops come out? Like mm -hmm. um, cherries, for instance. Cherries should be out in July, and you sometimes will get a second crop of cherries or sometime in December. Sometimes. Wow. Not always. And the thing is, is that we can, you can pretty much have cherries anytime you want. You can have strawberries anytime you want. Strawberries were usually only a summertime thing. Melons, same thing. We usually only got melons during the summer. Mm -hmm. Guess where we get them? We get them anytime we want. And the problem is, is that we also are, these were the things that, that fruits and stuff should be done in moderation and we should be doing them, um, during the time that they're in season yeah, and we get them, we can get them year round now. Yeah. And it's because they're being grown in other places and being shipped to us. Right. Well, what's in your local neighborhood? Where, where does that come from? And can, can you get that? Right. You might not, you, I mean, this is the thing as much as I hate it, avocados, they, they aren't grown in Texas. <laughs> they're not grown here. Mm -hmm. We get them from Mexico and uh, in California. I love them, but they're not something that I probably should be eating on a normal basis. I love them, but they probably are not something that you should you should be eating those when they're in season. Right. So, and it was um, like Winston A. Price, right? That was looking at different. Um, I think he, you know, started as a dentist and he was looking at dental health mm -hmm. um, and started noticing that like, wow, the people who are eating the foods that are local to their area mm -hmm. and in season tend to have really, really great dental health. Mm -hmm. um, and then that kind of like stemmed into looking at like their overall health and even seeing how the health of the mouth is kind of an indicator right. of your internal health. Um, but I, I, I just always come back to that and thinking like eating locally eating with the season mm -hmm. um, and how just like that one piece alone can mm -hmm. can really uh, help uh, help bring us up into our optimal health. Mm -hmm. um, and yet that is like pretty much the polar opposite mm -hmm. of what most people, at least in this country, mm -hmm. are doing. Um, and we look at a lot of the different diseases that are really plaguing mm -hmm. uh, the people in the West um, and in other places where they are eating locally and are eating seasonally, and maybe they don't have all the technological advances that we have, they'll actually have less of these chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it just kind of speaks to um, how important the food is that we're that we're putting into our bodies. And right. And then you look at the we you look at the um, civilizations that we've westernized yeah. and we've destroyed their health. We've completely destroyed their health. It's interesting. I'm trying to think of, because um, it's um, Samoans. We completely destroyed their health because we came in and westernized what they did. They stopped, mm -hmm. They and now they have food deserts, and they don't have foods to take care of these people. And now their uh, the obesity, cancer, heart disease, um, diabetes is off the charts. Mm -hmm. It's really disturbing. But that's because we came in and we westernized what um, and now they have McDonald's and Taco Bell and you name it and that kind of thing. And no real grocery stores, no farms, no, none of that. We destroyed all of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things I think too, is that we go in and we will, we're going to Americanize you people. Right. <laughs> and we're going to come in and we're going to, we're going to help you out. Well, wow. No, we're, we destroy health wherever mm -hmm. we go. And unfortunately, the the advertising engine behind all of these big mm -hmm. processed foods and fast food places and everything is just so extreme mm -hmm. um, that, yeah, people are like, you know, screaming, yes, please bring us McDonald's, bring us this. Oh, we were so excited when we got a Dairy Queen or whatever. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, as you're saying, it's not... No. It's not doing anyone any favors. Mm -mm. And unfortunately, at this point, I think that the foods people are consuming have created so many different health issues mm -hmm. or medical mysteries. My doctor doesn't know what's wrong with me mm -hmm. um, types of situations that, you know, it's, it's created a panic. Mm -hmm. And so people feel really overwhelmed. They feel really confused by all the different diets. Oh, do I go vegan? Do I go paleo? What do I do this? Mm -hmm. Whatever. And then we get so... Um, well, and don't forget that the low-fat diet is the one that our our country mm -hmm. has, and our particularly our government has backed for you know over forty years, and yeah. and they were wrong, they mm -hmm. were dead wrong, and 
um, still have a very difficult time saying we were wrong. Um, so you see now with the my plate thing, which is kind of ridiculous, um, that it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, well, it's so funny. So, and, I, and I'm glad you brought that up. The low fat thing has actually been like a really big topic to me for a long time. I did a video called the low fat trap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I was researching into that, I learned that uh, the studies that they did that indicated that fats were unhealthy for people, funded by the sugar industry. Mm -hmm. um, there was an entire, if you go and you check it out, NPR did an entire show about how the sugar industry came together, all of them, the big, there was four big sugar companies. They came together in a, in a meeting in Sugarland, Texas, um, years ago, and sat down and said, what are we going to do to get the heat off of us? It, off of sugar and put it somewhere else. And they made the decision to go after meat. And that's what they, so they came, went after saturated fats. And the problem is, is that, um, no, that's not, that's not where that landed. And they, it, they were, that, there was an entire story. It was really interesting to watch the corruption of something like that. Mm -hmm. If you, it's an NPR show. I can't remember the name of it, but if you, you talk about sugar going after saturated fat or whatever, the sugar industry pinning, um, poor health on saturated fat, th this is all that story. And it's mm -hmm. fun. The thing is, is that we keep trying to put the nail in that coffin and we still can't saturated fat is still getting a bad rap. Like yeah. I, my, my aunt, said to me not too long ago, I invited her to come to Pale Effects, not because she's vegan now. She went vegan less than a year ago. And I just invited her because um, I wanted her to come and them to see what we do. And my, yeah. my mom was living with her at the time, and I really wanted my mom to come. My mom's never been to Pale Effects. I just wanted her to see it. Um, it's incredible, by the way. Yeah, oh, thank you. It's <laughs> just I mean, I learned so much. Mm -hmm. I and just seeing all of the um, like physical health and fitness and all of these just incredible innovations that I didn't even know were there. It was it's incredible. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We um, work very hard to make it um, what it is. Um, but anyway, I I invited her to come, and her response back to me was, if I started doing, which I wasn't trying to get her to come to become paleo. I just wanted her to see it. Yeah. And my whole thing is, is if you choose, I can't choose for you. Mm -hmm. If you think that you need to do this, that's your, that's your choice. I can't make it for you. I can inform you. I can educate you, but I can't make you do anything. Right. So she said, if I went paleo, I would just be signing my death warrant. She goes, I would be immediately, I would immediately pretty much die. She's had all kinds of heart issues. My mom's had heart issues too. They've um, strokes the whole nine yards. And so it was very difficult for me to come back. I said to her, well, I wasn't asking you to come to turn you paleo. I think she would have come and become educated. I, no doubt about that. I believe that. But at the end of the day, if you think that you're vegan or vegetarian for health reasons, you're misinformed. Mm -hmm. You're highly uneducated. And you would do yourself a world of favors if you got yourself educated. Mm -hmm. Because the saturated fat myth is a myth. Mm -hmm. It is a lie. It was fabricated. It was fabricated by the sugar industry. And it is one that's been debunked more times than I can count. And continually, we come back to that same argument over and over again and have to keep re-debunking it and showing all the science that shows that's a lie. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Yeah. And so, um, so that's my counter to somebody that's vegan or vegetarian for health reasons. Mm -hmm. You're misinformed. Yeah. If you're vegan or vegetarian for ethical reasons, more power to you. I totally respect that. I have no problem whatsoever. But I'm going to fight to the, on the other one mm -hmm. because it's just not the truth. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you can't be healthy on a vegan or a vegetarian diet. But your vegan or vegetarian diet is going to look a lot more paleo if you're going to be healthy than it's not. Mm -hmm. And if you're a typical vegan or vegetarian, your diet's not healthy. It's interesting they, uh, you know, for as much as they demonized saturated fat, uh, what they actually ended up finding is that the 
far more detrimental fat to people. And it's funny because if you look at the chart, I mean, it's significantly worse for you mm -hmm. is the trans fats, right. the partially hydrogenated oils, right. which are, guess what? If you start reading your food labels, they're in everything. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every processed food or junk food out there is going to have those. Um, to the extent that uh, the the knowledge, understanding of trans fats has grown, and they said, oh, man, we got to tell people on the front of the label, mm -hmm. zero grams of trans fat. Well, you can still have partially hydrogenated oils in the food, mm -hmm. and they just have to alter the serving size enough so that it's, mm -hmm. you know, 0. 0.00 whatever percent in the serving size. So that's why sometimes you look at these processed and junk mm -hmm. foods, and you're like, well, that's a weird serving size. Well, it's because they're just altering the serving size to be just small enough mm -hmm. that they can say, you know, zero grams of trans And who eats on just label. one serving of any of those foods? Not me. No. <laughs> no, I'm saying, but if you consume those, wh who eats just one serving? Mm -hmm. It's It may be an odd serving size, but you think about it. Is it a serving size that you – general – so on, on the back of whatever it is, if it says the serving size is one cup, Americans generally consume two or three. Mm -hmm. We generally consume two or three servings of whatever it is that we're eating. That's the way we are. That's the way our plates look. When you look at our plates, we fill them up with whatever. And the thing is, is that our serving size may be this, and then our plate looks like this. Right. And it's interesting to me that people have not educated themselves on all of that and that they don't stay away from those things and that they continue to consume them. And so, yeah, I that's my challenge is get yourself educated and let's see how long you're going to stay vegan or vegetarian. Mm -hmm. If you think you're doing it for health reasons, get educated mm -hmm. because you're not. You're not doing yourself any favors. Mm -hmm. So I think also there's, um, like we're just kind of in a culture of, of too much, you know? And mm -hmm. so when you look at people who, um, who go towards a vegetarian or vegan diet mm -hmm. and it does help them feel better. And we kind of talked about this at the beginning. Well, yeah, it's because you've suddenly taken out a lot of really harmful things. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about the factory farming, but you could also just talk about the quantity of mm -hmm. meat that a lot of people consume. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in a lot of ways, you know, too much of anything mm -hmm. can be really harmful for you. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're eating too much red meat or whatever every mm -hmm. single day, every single meal, mm -hmm. I mean, most people who are meat eaters have meat at every meal. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a restaurant or something and, you know, they bring you the steak, usually like the whole plate mm -hmm. is the steak. <laughs> And maybe you have, like, this little tiny bowl of yeah. whatever other thing on the side. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, you know, very, very uh, clear mm -hmm. that just on that quantity piece alone, you know, people are just eating too much mm -hmm. of these foods. And then you can start talking about the factory farming, the health of the animals, the way that the meats are prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, cooking meats at really high temperatures is... Uh, now we know is like really terrible for us and we get the acrylamide and these different things when you're cooking at high heats. A lot of the foods out there are, are just plain deep fried. Yeah. Um, and just so that one piece. In hydrogenated oil. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or in the GMO soy yeah. oil or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, a lot of my, my health coaching clients, I, I see them feeling frustrated and confused mm -hmm. and they, and they, you know, there's a feeling like, okay, which diet should I do? Which mm -hmm. diet should I do? And I'm like, well, let's not put yourself into a box. Mm -hmm. If you find a box later that feels really good and you want to get in it, cool. Mm -hmm. But, like, just take the pressure off of yourself. Like, you mm -hmm. need to uh, completely assign yourself into one whole. Mm -hmm. And let's just do simple things. Like, we're going to stop eating the fried foods. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's such a big one. And it's a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. And I think if people can even just start to reduce mm -hmm. consumption, they're going to notice immediately that they start feeling better. Right. Looking at the quantity of meat and just something simple like, hey, whatever diet you do, chances are you should be eating more vegetables. Yes. And I think that across the board, most people are just, you know, just on that one mm -hmm. little thing. If right. People were eating more vegetables, mm -hmm. maybe reducing the quantity of the mm -hmm. meat that they're eating. And then, you know, you would see just a, a huge improvement in your health just from those two little things. Mm -hmm. And then you start talking about the grains, the processed foods. Um, we did a video years ago called The Easiest Diet Ever. Mm -hmm. And it was just about like, you know, eating things that, you know, your grandma would have eaten. Right. It comes from the ground. It doesn't come in a box. It doesn't have an ingredient label. 
that's five miles long. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just moving away from the processed foods, I think, has such a powerful impact on our bodies mm -hmm. um, that even if it feels uncomfortable to assign yourself into paleo or keto mm -hmm. or whatever, um, that if you can just get off the processed foods, reduce the refined sugar or mm -hmm. replace the refined sugar, we talked about that in the previous episode, um, switching to healthier alternatives. I mean, there's right. so much uh, coconut sugar instead of regular sugar, mm -hmm. uh, the zucchini noodles yeah. or zoodles instead yeah. of the highly processed refined carbohydrate pasta that we're all eating. Uh, you know, people get so frustrated and confused. I just want to try and convey to them that like, hey, it's easy. Yeah. Let's pick the easy changes that you can see yourself doing. Mm -hmm. um, because if your diet is stressing you out mm -hmm. and your attempt to try and figure out what diet you do is causing you a huge amount of stress, then like that alone is terrible for your health. Right. Uh, so yeah, to your point about the fact that this can all get very confusing for people in that, um, trying to figure out, okay, do I, do I get rid of sugar? Do I get rid of this? Whatever. Um, one of the things that I, when I coach people through, um, transitioning from a standard American diet is that I coach them on mitigating damage because mm -hmm. really at the end of the day, that's what, what we want to do. And so, um, the healthy alternatives, um, that you were talking about a little bit earlier. Those are the things, this is one of the reasons why Keith and I got involved in this company, ID Life, and we, um, our company is ID Life Wellness. And so one of the reasons we got involved in it is because in a perfect world, everyone would eat whole foods and stop eating processed foods and all of those companies would go out of business and, and um, you know, people wouldn't eat refined sugar and carbohydrates and all of that stuff. That would be a perfect world where we could get everybody to eat whole foods. That's not going to happen. And I'm aware of that and I'm a realist. And so my thought process is, can we at least get them to healthier alternatives? Can we at least get them to a healthier situation where they are actually starting to have health wins that actually encourage them to continue on that journey? Because oh, yeah. this is the thing at the end of the day, when you start going, when you just make the decision that I'm going to go paleo, I'm on a standard American diet, you are going to go through what we call a carb flu. And it's not pretty. It's not fun. It doesn't feel good. And most people stop at that point. They're like, man, I just don't feel good. It's making me feel really bad. Well, yes, it is because you have done a lot of damage over however many years to your body and your body is detoxing. And when it starts detoxing, you start feeling it. You start feeling like crap. But when the, for the people that push through that and get to the other side, they end up in a place where they're like, oh my God, I feel amazing. I feel so good. The problem is the majority of people are not going to do that. They just don't, aren't going to put themselves through that kind of pain. Separation from foods that you love. I went through that myself. Mm -hmm. Being separated from the foods that I love because I, for my health, was really pissed me off. And so the thing is, is that there are people that just feel such a connection to some of those things. Mm -hmm. So through ID Life, we offer an alternative where we have customized vitamins for people. Um, this is like we were talking about earlier. Even if you are eating healthy, chances are the foods that you're eating do not have enough nutrients in them to meet your daily requirement of nutrients. Mm -hmm. And because of soil depletion, environmental toxins, um, toxic runoff, GMOs, pesticides, you name it, right. um, rat, free radicals, the whole nine yards. We have all of this going against us. You cannot eat enough organic food. You cannot eat enough grass-fed meat. You cannot eat enough of that stuff for you to get all of your nutrients. So you have to supplement in some way to be able to optimize your health. Now, can you just eat that way and be healthy? Yeah, but do you want to optimize or do you want to just be average? I'm not a person that wants to be average. I want to optimize. So I supplement. I give my, my body all these extra nutrients so that it, it can fight all the free radical damage. It can fight cancer. It can fight all of these things that I'm going to come into contact with over my lifespan. And so 
the customized vitamins. Then there's, um, we have healthy sports drinks instead of, you know, you have mm. Powerade and Gatorade oh. that have partially hydrogenated vegetable oil and in them and syrup high fructose and corn syrup. syrup. It, yeah. So we have alternatives for that. We have a high, what it's called hydrate and it doesn't have any added sugars in it. It is, um, sugar free. And then we have energy drinks that are not monster and, you know, um, Red Bull and that are not actually can't cause you heart issues. Um, mm -hmm. then we have, um, weight loss products that help, um, particularly our brand new one. Slim Plus is amazing. It actually has a prebiotic in it that actually feeds your good gut biota. We've destroyed our guts. That's part of our problem where we started destroying our guts and then we end up with all of these autoimmune issues because we've destroyed the, our gut lining. So this helps build gut lining. It actually helps with serotonin and making you feel good. And then it also helps suppress appetite in it. And so we have all these great, these are the healthy alternatives. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that actually, cause there's a lot of people that are like, well, they can just be paleo or they could just be this. Why do you do that? And have felt like we have, um, sold out. We haven't. And the reason we haven't is because at the end of the day, not everybody's going to do this, but if I can right. give somebody an opportunity to do something better for their health, that is an alternative to what they did previously, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. We got, we got lambasted for the fact that we were, um, we partnered with Zevia. Zevia is a calorie free, um, and, uh, sweeten, um, uh, it's sweetened with Stevia, um, soda. Well, my thought process is I would rather have somebody drinking Zevia than drinking a, a, a Coke that's filled with aspartame and what have you. Um, that's the other big myth, too, is the Diet Cokes and stuff. People think they're doing themselves a favor. They're eating a hamburger and French fries and a, a big shake, and then they're going to have a diet soda to, to offset it all. Well, you're actually making things worse. If you're going to do a Coke, do the full-blown thing if you're going to do it, mm -hmm. but Zevia is a great alternative. Yeah. It gives somebody an opportunity. I wish Zevia had been around when I was trying to get off of Coke. Me too. Honestly. It would have been so <laughs> wonderful. And this is the thing. There are times too where, you know, um, not lately because of the Slim Plus, it, it takes care of cravings and stuff. But when you have a craving, sometimes it's nice to just have a little Zevia because then you feel like you've got a little treat and you're good and you don't have, you don't just go blow yourself off the, you know, the wagon. And mm -hmm. so... And, and I don't know. So at the end of the day, I think you have to make all the, uh, the choices that work best for you, mm -hmm. but, but you know, it's about mitigating damage. Yeah. And that's really the bottom line is how much damage can you mitigate in every choice that you make of everything that you put in your mouth? And can, do you choose to have the, you know, Diet Coke or do you choose to have a Zevia? Do you choose to, um, you know, have a, whatever at, um, a Red Bull, or do you choose to have something like our energy drink? Do you choose to have a Powerade or a Gatorade? And the worst part is we're giving that crap to our kids. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, just, I mean. And they were like, God, why are all the kids so hyper? Right. And why, why is ADD and ADHD exploding? Oh, I can tell you red number nine. Sorry, but I mean, like, it's the, all of the, the additives and the artificial colors and the artificial flavors that we're putting into all of the stuff we have. Why do you think we're having children that can't sit still and cannot mm -hmm. stay focused and what have you? It's because of all the crap that's been put into them. They can't. They can't. It's, it's you know, um, totally, you know, firing everything in their central nervous system. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And so I my that's our thing is that, can we offer healthy alternatives to people who feel like they can't give things up? Yeah. Absolutely. Right. We have healthy alternatives. We have the best that we can possibly give. Mm -hmm. And we've chosen to partner with this company because everything that they do is backed by science and evidence. There's not a single thing that's not backed by science and evidence. And so mm -hmm. we, and that for us is our, I mean, if you're going to tell anybody in the paleo world to do something, you better have the science to back that up. Yeah. And we do. And so that's one of the reasons why we're involved in it is because we believe it is the healthiest alternative to some of these things that people just absolutely say they can't give up when right. it's time to, when it's time to um, retrieve their health. Right. And I think you're so right that I, and I love that uh, mitigating damage kind of thing because it is, it's overwhelming to think about like completely transitioning your diet 
completely giving up all of these things that not only do we have physical attachments to, but we have really emotional. strong emotional yeah, mm-hmm. attachments to these foods. And um, Well, you grew up here in Texas too. Mm-hmm. It's really difficult for us here in Texas. We grew up with Mexican food. Yeah. We love Mexican food. But when I go to a Mexican restaurant, I mitigate damage. I order corn instead of flour, tortillas, if I'm going to if I'm going to have them. Sometimes I just don't even have any of that. Right. But at the end of the day, it's about making the best possible choice that you can make at that moment mm-hmm. and not feeling not beating yourself up over it right. because if you if this these you, you have these choices and you choose the best one that you possibly can for yourself every single time you're going to eventually get healthier mm-hmm. but it's about making those choices each time and trying to really mitigate damage and there are times where you're going to blow it out and you're going to be you're going to eat whatever you're going to have cake you're going to have you know um beer whatever you're going to have those things. Have them enjoy them to the fullest and don't feel guilty or shameful about it. Just get back to the right choices as soon as you quick can. What happens is so many people will fall off of that wagon, get off the reservation and feel like they can't come back. Yeah. Well, they can. Yeah. And I think that, you know, take just taking that little kind of uh, segue over to talking about like the shame and guilt around food. I mean, I think that it's really, really unfortunate that, you know, this whole idea of, you know, getting healthy has largely been completely demonized by the mainstream Mm -hmm. to where people have these thoughts like, oh, healthy food doesn't taste good. Mm -hmm. Oh, if it tastes tastes good, that means it's bad for you. Yeah. And there's just all of these little kind of, uh, you know, presumptions or whatever Mm -hmm. that we've made uh, that kind of uh, keep us leaning Mm -hmm. towards those really unhealthy foods. And you could start asking, well, hmm, who has a financial incentive Mm -hmm. to make us feel guilty about these things, but to also make us feel really overwhelmed Mm -hmm. at the idea of eating healthy? Yeah. Um, And then you factor in that, like, those processed foods are engineered to Mm -hmm. make people overeat. They're engineered to literally be addictive. Yeah. uh, Physically, emotionally, et cetera. Um, So that's something that I come back to a lot is, is... Letting people know that, like, hey, yeah, we're human. We're living in this world where the deck is kind of stacking, stacked against us in terms of eating healthier. So every little thing that you do, drinking a glass of water in the morning every morning, mm-hmm. boom, you just did something really healthy for yourself and celebrate that. Yeah. You know, celebrate those things because I think a big part of the the guilt and the shame and the just general, like, resistance to getting healthy or it's going to be hard or I have to give up things I don't want um, that makes it even more challenging mm-hmm. than it already is mm-hmm. um, so as you know uh, wellness advocates or whatever you might want to call us I think a big piece of that is giving people things that are realistic right and letting them know that like hey whatever's realistic for you to do like swap out one of your sodas for a Zevia, swap out the sugar in your coffee for a coconut sugar. Mm-hmm. Like every one of those things should be celebrated and you should feel so proud of yourself right. for doing it. Um, because that kind of negative self-talk, really mm-hmm. being really hard on ourselves thing, that's a really hard thing to escape. And I think that's why so many people um, struggle with mm-hmm. things like losing weight or quote unquote getting healthy mm-hmm. Um just because there's so much of that like mental hurdle mm-hmm. to get over in what has been uh, conditioned in us mm-hmm. from all of these big you know corporations who stand to profit from us continuing eating these foods and continuing with the health problems that result from it. No, and I completely agree with you. And the thing is, it's funny because Keith and I just did this talk at um, Ancestral Health Symposium, and we did the talk at South by Southwest this year, um, and it's. Um, the human zoo. We are zoo animals. Mm-hmm. We are in a such an environmental mismatch with what our environment currently is to what w- we were meant to be living in. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is it's of our own making. It's of our own. We are trapping ourselves in our own prison. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, unless we recognize it and we start making the choices to get out of that, we're going to remain zoo animals. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you think about it, um, Animals, except for the ones that we have chosen to, to that are in captivity or that we have fed or that are have taken care of by us, taken care of by us, don't 
suffer all of the all of the diseases and all of the um, ailments that we do as humans. Mm-hmm. They don't. Now, our animals, our domesticated animals, they all do. You see obesity is on the rise with animals um, that are, you know, domestic animals and animals in captivity that are fed at zoos. Mm-hmm. They are, the, none of them have to worry about their weight. You think about that. They None of them worry about their weight. Right. None of them have to worry about any of that stuff. They don't have to, they don't have to go through all that process and they don't suffer all the diseases that we do. Mm-hmm. But it's because we have created this zoo. We've created our, our cage Mm -hmm. and we're living in it and we're choosing to stay there. We can choose to open the door and get out, Mm -hmm. but we have to make that choice. Michelle, I just want to thank you so much for being here today and for sharing all of this with us. It's been very enlightening for me and just really I'm looking forward to having you back on the program again. Thank you. Uh, So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I've had so much fun. I appreciate it. Definitely. I want to thank all of you for listening, tuning into the Wellness Plus podcast. You can watch the video versions of these podcasts over on wellnessplus.tv. And if you'd like to learn more about Michelle and Paleo FX, you can visit paleofx.com. I want to thank all of you for listening. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.